press release. Can I see a sign of hands? Does anybody know what the meeting's about? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Quite a few. The meeting, for the, the, one, the people that didn't get to actually see what it's about, is we're going to talk specifically, but I have an agenda, specifically about soliciting. And soliciting bothers all of us. And I'm going to give you guys some strategies. I really am because I'm tired of it myself. I live here in the community as well. And uh, when I say I'm tired of it, none of us are tired of appropriate soliciting. All of us are tired of being hassled or bothered or, or from solicitors that are not, you know, that are aggressively pursuing us while we're trying to do things in our yards or whatever. Now, they're few and far in between. I really believe that, but they're out there. So I'm going to give you some tactics that are going to help you to address that issue. We're not going to violate anybody's rights, a solicitor's rights, a homeowner's rights, or anything like that. I'm not about that. Never been about that. I'm here to just, I've, I've heard this from a number of people over 26 years with the village that have complained about solicitors and soliciting. And there probably isn't anyone in this room that maybe you haven't called the police about it or you haven't uh, reported to the village, yeah. but it hasn't had a bad occurrence. It, 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 even if you go shopping, you can have a bad situation, yeah. right? This is to help you avoid that maybe and to set up some parameters that will uh, leave you open to soliciting if, it's, if you want it. And on the dates that you don't want it or days you don't want it or times you don't need it, uh, you, you make it clear that you don't want it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you here, Let's, let me ask you this. Who wants to be bothered by solicitors on the day that they have a funeral for a loved one? No one, right? Now, who, who's going to be a little more agitated by that solicitor just approaching them, right? Is it the solicitor's fault necessarily? No. They're doing their solicitor, they're doing what they do every day. So we're going we're gonna to come up with some, some real strategies that will hopefully help. They're going to help me create those and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get your involvement and I and we're gonna go on to a couple of other uh, very important topics that I have outlined the first thing I'm going to do is take a poll so here's part of the active part okay I'm gonna ask all of you to think of a number okay think of a number between zero and nine and I want you to pick the most significant of those numbers to you. You can justify it any way you want in your mind, but what is, you know, I want it to have purpose. It's not just a number. It's a value, okay, to you, okay? I don't want to give you suggestions. I'm not even going to do that. I want you to pick that out yourself, okay? I want you to think about that. And I want to give everybody enough time. If you're wrestling with two numbers, Narrow it down to one. Choose the most prominent, the one that's the most important to you. This is not a big, when I said a test, it's not a test. This is just, this is just something that I thought, and this is something I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I want to see. Okay. How many of you, raise your hands, have chosen the number zero? Okay. How many of you have chosen the number one? Okay. Wait, do that again. How many chose the number one? Okay. Um, how many have chosen the number two? Okay. I hope everybody's participating. Is anybody not going to participate? Because I honestly, I want to, because I'm going to total this all up. How many people are here? And I want y'all to tell me, please. Okay. 
Uh, so every is there anybody that wants to now raise their hand for zero, one, or two? <laughs> Let me know because you weren't planning on participating. Because now I'm looking to make sure you participate. <laughs> Boy, I'm tough, aren't I? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Okay, number three. I got it. This is tough because I got to count. <laughs> okay, got about there. All right. All right. All right. Um, and I and and I don't want to take my shoes off and use my toes. So I'm trying to do this the right way. Okay. Number four. Okay. Number five. Get him up there. Uh, nope, nope. You missed it. You missed the beginning, so I can't, I can't put you in there. Number six. Everybody, this. By the way, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna interrupt. Uh, the chief Pavlicek just, just arrived. Don't interrupt. Keep going, Sarge. Oh, We're all good. I, I love having this opportunity. So the chief is here. The chief of police. Uh, I'll save all those questions you have for him till the end. Uh, there you go. And, he'll, and that's and he told me to do that because then he had, he can excuse. I have to go right now. No, I'm just kidding. That's a tactic I used to use until they assigned me to this program. When I come to your door and take that report, oh, I got another call. I got to go talk to somebody. And everybody does that type of stuff in a sense, but not hopefully everybody does it for honest purposes. And, and policemen, you generally are honest people. And that's what I'm saying. When I say generally, I mean I believe that they're, they are honest. You know, when you find a bad one, you've got a lot of people just like anyone. Um, number six. I need sixes. Four. Five. Okay. Number seven. Okay. Wait. Do that again. Seven. Okay. I actually counted wrong. Number eight. Number nine. Believe me, there is there is a logic to this that you guys that you're probably wondering where where is he going on this? So what I did was what we did was a real quick poll, and I asked you all to. Do, I'm just going to start over here a little bit, just real quick. But I asked you all to think of a number zero through nine that's significant. Okay. To, to you for whatever purpose it's significant for, but to pick the most significant number out of those numbers. So you have to do a little thinking, what's, what's some of the reasons? And, and if I ask around the room, how many people, just kind of a quick hand, how many people picked uh, a number of their immediate family or something of that nature? I, uh, yeah, so several people, four or five people. Um, some of you might have picked, uh, some of you might have a favorite number that's zero through nine, and that's just it, and, so, and there might be other reasons. Uh, it might just be you and your spouse, might be, because we had some twos, do we have twos? Yeah, we had a couple of twos. But, so, just, just real quickly, somebody give me some other reasons why they picked their number, if they have anything significant or any reason for that number that they care to share, they don't have. Anybody have something? Birth want? month. First month? Okay. I chose zero because I have zero tolerance for anybody who solicits me for anything. Okay. You know, you're kind of tough. And I want to say this. Uh, Chief, do we have any openings on the police department? <laughs> I think I've got a new recruit. Okay. Good. I chose number one because I, I, I like to deal with people and think in my mind, you're number one. You're, you're first in my mind. Okay, very good. I'm going to, and, and, and I'm glad she said that about number one because number one's going to be, and, I, and I, I did not know what the results were going to be, but when I was thinking this over, number one was first and foremost in my mind. Okay, and I'm going to tell you in a minute what I think, uh, why that is significant. Anybody else have any other reason? Like, cause some of, some of you, let me just ask this. Um, uh, some of the people that chose six and seven, or seven, which was the highest, 
Is there a reason why you chose seven? Is it just because you like to go to Vegas and roll the dice? Or? Lucky seven. Go ahead. I was born on the seventh. My daughter was born in July, which is the seventh month. Seven's a lucky number, and I got three of them on my license plate. Okay. There you go. So seven is your number. You like seven. You said something about seven? Lucky seven. Lucky seven, right? Yeah. You, you know. And my grandfather taught me when I was a young boy. He was a carpenter, and my dad was a policeman, and I'm in the backyard with my grandfather, and he's showing me how to roll dice, and he's teaching me what's seven. <laughs> it's a true story. True story. I remember my dad coming home going, Dad, what are you doing? And he goes, hey, he's your problem. You worry about him. I didn't teach you how to roll dice, but I'm teaching him how to roll dice. We're having fun, okay? So, you know, that's, you know, and fortunately for me, that's one of the things I want to say this because you guys all get a kick out of this. That is probably the only thing that I didn't take to school with me in my lifetime that I learned from my father or my grandfather or someone else that got me into trouble. My dad got me in the most trouble that I ever could be in. Now, he was a, he was a, I believe he was a detective or a sergeant on the police department at the time. And he had to come to my school because the principal called my home, and my mother, of course, said, you go get him, you go talk to him, you go find out what's going on. And my dad was working as a patrolman that day. He drove to the school in his squad car. And he came in, and he sat down in the principal's office. He has no idea why I've been called down there. And uh, I, for the sake of the footage here, I'm not gonna describe what I did because you know, like I said, I impressionable you do things. After the filming's over, I will be glad to tell all of you not to, to share this with your grandchildren. I turned it off. You did, did you really turn it off? No. 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 All right. <laughs> nice. Nice. Nice try. That's Alan Stash, and you need to watch him. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. So. I did something as a child that my father had showed me at home. You know, and he said, don't ever do this, but when I was a kid, I did this in school and I got in trouble. About a week later, I don't know why, I was thinking about it and I was showing a friend in the lunchroom and the next thing you know, him and I are doing the exact same thing my father did. We got caught like my father did. We got called down to the principal's office. The principal was none too happy with a couple of little children. Where did you come up with this idea? <laughs> so now this gets really good, and I'm going to try to make this quick. My father shows up in uniform to the, to the principal's office. And he's there, and he's like, and, and I want to tell you, my dad and I became the greatest of friends after this experience. <laughs> The principal says, I don't know where. The other boy says, your son taught him how to do this. And I don't know where a boy his age would have learned this. And my dad goes, where did, who told you how to do this? My dad says. And I go, I don't know. I just kind of came up with it and everything. My dad goes, well, we're going to have a long talk when we get home. Now, my dad was sweating profusely. Because had I have said in front of that principal <laughs> that my father and dad, when you watch this on the internet, you know what I'm talking about, the incident, had taught me how to do this. He never told me go do it at school. He never told, as a matter of fact, he told me not to do this, not to hurt anybody, not to do anything, you know, malicious like a little kid would do, you know. And uh, I did. I, I did exactly what I wasn't supposed to do, and I got, I got punished for that. And it, it, it and that's corrective behavior. How many of us here had <coughs> corrective behavior when we were children from our parents? None of you were ever corrected. Oh, come on. I got a group of saints here, and I'm talking to the wrong group. Are you still all that worried that your mom and dad are up there going, you're better? <laughs> you're like, oh, geez. Oh, I was an angel. OK, so uh, you know. There's, 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 there's a lot of significance to a lot of different things, but getting back to the, the numbers, the one number I want to talk about, uh, the one thing that I thought about when I put this little exercise together was, um, what if I had a group of about 15, 16 year olds in here, 17 year olds, adolescents, our, our children, our grandchildren, whatever the case may be, how, how do you think those numbers might be different? 
I want to say one person chose one. They even explained their reason. It was nothing like what I think a 15, 16, or 17 year old would use when they chose the number one. Why do you think we don't choose one? And when you're much younger, you might choose one. You see, kids always do it. When they buy shirts, they put the number one on it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. They're struggling. Yeah, they're struggling a little bit with their self confidence. Yes? One is as low as you can go. Yeah, and one is as low as you can go. And in, in some generations, they might even, you know, generations change on opinions of themselves and things like that. That could be an effect too. Another thing is, it's also a number one is also considered like the best, the number one golfer in the world, the number one basketball player in the world, the highest paid basketball player in the world is considered what? Number one, Michael Jordan, you know, number 23. Yeah, also number one, right? Number one in all, all sports fans' eyes uh, a lot of times, you know, as a basketball player and as a leader. People think highly of number one like that, and especially at a younger age. But when we get to our age, I'm going to include me because, you know, like I told you, I got my AARP card. Um, when you get to be our age, number one isn't as significant, is it? I mean, at the very least, it's oftentimes two, three. It's family. It's, it's, and you, it's friends. It's a neighbor across the street. Sometimes, sometimes I've seen uh, my neighbors mowing their neighbor's yard before they mow theirs. And, you know, if they got a, somebody that is not able to mow it, somebody that's very elderly. It doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it happens not by a 16, not often by a 16-year-old boy that says, I'm not going to go with my friends, I'm going to go across the street and mow the uh, gentleman's yard across the street first. Now, we have really good people, young people growing up, and some of them do things like that. And, but they might not jump at it first, they might jump at it the next day, you know what I'm saying. So number one might very well be a much higher polled number in a group this size if we were talking about a younger crowd, right? So that when I'm trying, what I what I wanted this exercise to demonstrate to all of you because your numbers uh, you've got from three to seven are the strength of your numbers, okay? So my guess is. You know, except with a rare exception where, because I never really gave a parameter. My guess is often that's reflective of a value system that is sharing, caring, and thinking about other people. <coughs> More than just yourself. So I just kind of want to throw that in there. I want to do that. And I want to share our thoughts and, and, and talk about that and kind of reflect on some of the generational differences. Now remember what I've told you before. Who has the biggest impact on, on that young generation, that new generation? Parents do, but really? Grandparents do. Oh my goodness. Grandparents really do. Uh, mom and dad can tell Junior they don't want him to go out Friday night. And Junior will sit there and go, all right, mom, dad, come on, come on. Grandpa or grandma will come in there and say, you know, honey, I worry about you. Oh, don't worry, Grandma. I know, I know, I know, man. You know, don't worry about it. And they want. They're more concerned that you're worried about it, and they understand your concerns, and they know what they're doing Friday night, right? <laughs> more so than anything. But they're not going to treat mom and dad like that, are they? No, because it's a whole different thing. So, um, you know, I, I'm just kind of discussing with you a little bit about the different things, how that. Is impact impacts you. But let's get to soliciting now. When we're talking about soliciting, we're talking about different things. Solicitors <coughs> need to be registered at the village of Villa Park. Door to door soliciting. Okay? Not talking about mail solicitors. I'm not talking about mail soliciting. I'm not talking about telephone <coughs> soliciting. I'm talking about door to door soliciting when I talk about that. Okay? And One of the things that I want to share with you when I told you that I don't want to go into detail and start reading this stuff too much, but well, one of the things I told you is I want to talk about some strategies on how you can help yourself with this stuff. Now, first of all, let me just say this. Let me just say this. They have hours of operation. They really, truly do. Okay? Solicitors are issued permits by the Village of Villa Park, and on those permits and, and the information that they're given, they're given the hours. 
Who, who knows what the hours for soliciting are in the village of Villa Park? By ordinance. Nine to seven. Okay. Any other ideas? Nine to five. I have the ordinance in my hand, and I hope that it's, it's reflective of the current, anything current, and I believe it is. Uh, I took it right off the internet, okay? So this is what's available on the internet for all of you to access. Um, it lists soliciting hours, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Wow. Is that correct, Chief? Oh. That's what the page says, that's what yeah, it says. That's, yeah, as far as I know, so. I argue with the paper. Right. Okay, and that's any day other than Sunday, okay, all right, so they're not supposed to solicit, from what I understand, on Sunday, if I read this correctly, but what I'm trying to tell you, or, yeah, no, no soliciting on Sunday, so if you get a solicitor on Sunday, that's, that's your day of rest from solicitors, you can call us, we'll come out, we'll stop them. They could be licensed and registered and just violating the policy. We can, you know, we can note it. We can send it off to the village. It might be unintentional. It might be an employee that didn't understand. Yes. Does this apply to politicians also? <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to now. Does it apply to politicians? All right. Why'd you say that word? <laughs> Politics or politicians or government or things like that. That's that's a whole nother issue, okay? And because of, uh, you know, we can't intrude on uh, the laws, the federal government's laws that have been, that, that provide people the freedom of speech and the freedom of, a politician is, now they're not soliciting Hopefully, they're not going door to door and saying, give to my campaign. You might think they're soliciting your vote. That's questionable because they're not asking you to sign anything confirming that you're voting for them. You understand what I'm saying? You still have the free choice on polling day to go in and vote for whoever you want. They're promoting themselves. There and there, it's it's, and since there is freedom of speech and that is granted, am I right on this, Chief? They have the right to do that. Tell me if you feel that I I, I don't want to misstate anything on that. That's yeah, a very important important topic. Politicians going door to door looking for your vote are not considered soliciting. Are not registered or licensed. And what times they choose to come to your door. You'd think if they want your vote, they'd pick a good time to come and be nice, because if they come and make you angry, how do you get even with them? You don't vote for them. So, yeah, that's, that's a problem in itself. not subject to regulation. So That's a problem in itself, because what's a good time to have a politician come to your door? <laughs> I mean, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm being humorous a little bit there, but I mean, there have been occasions when I've had somebody come to my door. I remember a, a number of years ago, I had a, a gentleman who was running for the... Um, Illinois House or the Illinois um, Senate, and he came to my door and we talked for a while. And I, but I, he caught me at the right time. But would uh, that same apply on Sundays to a religious group coming and knocking on the door as with politicians? So, oh, not subject to regulation. The, 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 the religious group is a, not. A lot of the First Amendment, um, in yes. fact, there's actually a lawsuit case that uh, the Chicago Tribune sued. <laughs> claiming we're selling our newspaper, freedom of the press, you can't regulate us, and they tried to sue on that, but they're selling their newspaper. Yeah, religious and political um, are not subject to regulation. So what they choose to do and how they choose to offend you only goes against their mission and their vote. So there's, there's and, and, and the best way to do, so you can put up, and we're gonna talk about this, one of the things I'm, I was gonna say, I was gonna help empower you with is the, how to identify yourself as somebody who doesn't want soliciting at all. But I, I wanted to say that, but that does not apply to these topics we're talking about here, the political and the religious groups. They're, they're not soliciting. They're not really soliciting. They're not, now, if they are soliciting, uh, 
and then you know you might want to call the police out to question whether they are a because if they don't have a permit then it could be that they we would want them to have a permit if it was in other words let's say you had several members from one uh, church or organization here in the community that was going out soliciting but it was kind of not really a church matter it was they are all five members of the church and they all got together and they all thought they'd do this thing but it's kind of outside the church it's kind of but it but it, it started within it it's there but it's their personal agenda okay and you know we could identify that and we could help them to recognize that they need a permit if there's an issue so, yes. When the village issues a permit and say there's four or five people, does each individual get a permit or is it just one for the group? No, yeah. Um, on these mass soliciting efforts by, um, and, and I want to refer you too to the, the proper jurisdiction to look into that, but on these mass uh, deals where you'll see uh, a guy will go out, a gentleman will go out and he'll have a car loader or a bus full of kids and then they'll go and they'll hit five blocks and they'll walk down the blocks and he'll drive down to the other end and pick them up and they're selling magazines or they're doing different things and they've got a permit. Oftentimes the person with the, with the permit is going to be the gentleman who's driving them and and we've gotten these before um, what happens in those cases is when you ask for the permit they don't display a permit because they don't have it um, the then you are going to probably call us and we do get those calls and and we get them every time certain those types of activities are going out and then the officer's got to go out and locate. We locate one of the young people, and then he tells us where the guy is waiting for him. And we go to him, and we identify what they're doing, who they're with, and what organization, whether they have a permit. When we do call, do we call 911, or do we call the emergency number, uh, the non-emergency number? <laughs> you, when you want, a, when you're looking for, and we discussed this before, uh, at previous ones, but not everybody was present, so that's a very good question. Uh, when you need police service, you dial 911, okay? So um, other than um, something like uh, you want to call and find out when uh, parking permits are going to be sold in the, the train parking lot, then you're going to need to talk, call Monday through Friday to the administrative number and you're going to want to speak to you know one of our personnel to find out what that upcoming date is three months in advance but when you need a police car let me just say this when you need a police unit a police officer because the unit includes the officer and that's what you're really after when you need them to respond to your area to check into something identify something report something you're going to dial 911 that is how all our police officers are dispatched. Okay, is through the 911 service. All right. So, uh, all right. Any more questions on that topic? Or can I? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, many, many of us feel like we don't want to abuse the system. I know. And uh, do you know? Do you know? The you gentleman know. asked if there was a non-emergency. Now, how? There is, but I'm right? going to tell you this. That's overworked. That non-emergency number gets overworked, and and and, and um, very often we get calls at, at that non-emergency number that are that require a police officer to go to the scene. Okay, um, that is it. it the, let me just explain to you the the most important tendency or the most important tenant on that. If you dial the non-emergency police number, you are going to get a recording if you haven't dialed it. And it's going to ask you to what, it's going to give you a list of options to dial. First of all, if you need to talk to a police officer now, is that a good way to go through anything? No, 911 will have a dispatcher answer. And when I say a dispatcher, really a call, an emergency call taker. Okay, 
and they're going to take the information and get what they need to know. They're also probably in the first couple of seconds or minutes going to determine if this is an emergency. What is the priority of this call? So you don't need to feel like if you're calling in uh, for a non-emergency that they don't know how to process that call and, and to put you on hold and to, if there's something more pressing, they do. They'll, they'll handle it appropriately. And they've got, uh, we've got quite a uh, 911 center, big, large 911 emergency uh, communication center for this region. It's not just our community, it's, it's, it's lots of communities and lots of services. Yes? Is it still, if I take my cell phone, and I dial 911. Does this still go out to DuPage County? So what I must tell them that I want Villa Park? The short answer to your question is yes. Cell phones go to the sheriff's office. First thing you got to tell them is I'm in Villa Park. Right. Transfer that call. Now the Smart 911 optional program we use it here. Um, if you haven't seen it and you, if you have internet, uh, Smart911.com. It's safe to sign up. You see it. I think on your emails I see it referred to, mine we do, and that's an additional program here in DuPage County where you can add information about your home, your vehicle, your home phone number, your cell phone number. It's extra stuff so that when you dial in, we get the extra stuff. I have an account. My account says um, it's got both my cell phone and my home phone number. Um, it, it, it says where the gas meter is on my property in case I got to shut off the gas in case of a fire, where the electrical service panel is. It says that I'm a police officer and I have firearms in the house. So you better be knocking loudly if you're coming through my door because I'm waiting on the other side just in case they, they come for an emergency or something. So I put that information in. Here's the vehicle that I own. If the vehicle's here, where am I? So short answer, long answer, yes, cell phones go to the sheriff's office. Yes, tell them immediately you're in Villa Park or wherever you are. I mean, think about if you're on vacation. You're in beautiful downtown San Diego, California. You dial 911, you don't want it ringing the Villa Park police, right? Uh, right. But it, it goes to the, the regional center and you tell them exactly where you are. You have to so. tell them where you are. And, and, and one of the, there's two things though that, that, that are important too. On that smart 911 registry, let's say you've got an elderly person living with you at home, somebody like your mother or your father that's not able to care for themselves and they are not able to speak in the phone or whatnot, they dial 911 or you, you know, but let's say they're in a certain room where you have children in your home, grandchildren, children, and you want, if a fire call came out, for the fire department to know immediately where the children's bedrooms are. You can identify that, southeast corner, upper level. The, the reason, and, and here, the reason why I would never tell you to give out too much information if it wasn't secure. This information has been secured. You know, it, it, and, I, and case in point, if the chief registered his phone, it's secure. We, we, we as a police department and as a police agency feel it's secure. Now, we demanded proof. Okay. We don't just accept people's words on things like that. So because everybody's concerned about that kind of information. It's amazing to me that the way it's set up, that information can only be accessed, not by the police department, not by a police officer on our terminals at, at, at work, only by a 911 emergency tele, uh, uh, um, so well, no, only by a 911 emergency dispatcher, somebody at that location who has a special computer, a special system, and this is the important thing. That information comes up on their screen. They have it for the length of the call. As soon as they code out the call, it's gone. It disappears off the screen. They have to take whatever they need off the flash message, in other words, the 911 message, are the smart 911 message and put it onto the CAD system if they want it to become part of the record, okay, part of the call. And they would do that if they dispatch the fire department and they advise the fire department that the 911, the smart 911 entry says there's a child that lives in the upper bedroom and they've got a smoke alarm activation they're going to, they would tell them which bedroom. That's all that gets transferred over, whatever they give out on dispatch, okay. That's kind of 
that's that's important to all of us. First of all, because all of us are out to protect our privacy in today's modern world of information getting s spread around. But at the same time, we're out to protect our 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 family, our friends, and uh, people, people, property, and, and, and things like that. Valuables. Um, um, so that that's a, that was a good question. Um, did did I answer it all the way, Ben? Yeah, yeah, did the chief the answer? Chief. Actually, the chief did the answer. I like <laughs> well, the chief's answer. That was very good. Totally Thank you, chief. Um, all right. So, uh, basically, we got off on the 911 thing. But um, soliciting, I want to go back to soliciting real quick, then I'm going to go into the next topic. Is there anybody got any more questions about the soliciting? Yes. If you have a no solicitors invited sticker on the door, does that include the people that have the solicitors that have permits or not to solicit? No solicit. Yeah. Well, no. the people that have permits are required to have permits. Yeah. The village has requirements to have those permits. If they don't show you a permit, you can call the police department, and the police department will send somebody out nine one one. And we'll send somebody out to verify that they are a registered solicitor. And if they aren't, we have ordinances for dealing with that. And we either get them solicited or registered immediately, cease their activities, identify who they are, or if it's a violation or something of major concern, we can issue them a possible citation right away for that. Okay, it depends. It's gonna. We're gonna do a little bit of investigation. But they are allowed to uh, no, knock on your door or ring your bell, even if you. If have you that know, if you have, and that, that's one of the topics I'm gonna get to. I'm oh, gonna go I'm to sorry. it right now because we're sorry. there. That's okay. We're there. I wanted to give you some some ideas about some some methods that are gonna help you because that's that's and this is one of them. No soliciting. We have the ordinance that if the signs posted no soliciting or, and we have the policy and when these solicitors sign the group, if there's a sign, they're not supposed to ring your doorbell. Right. Okay. Now, but they do. Think it, well, they do. And think of it this way. I've seen most of your no soliciting signs. I've seen the one I put up in my house. And I'm going to tell you this. If you have a no soliciting sign that was made to look beautiful on your home and it's inscribed with the uh, old English letters and says no so I'm just saying though some of us do that and it says no soliciting very often it's not going to get noticed and when it does get noticed is what when when I walk down the sidewalk and I see there's a nice plaque up there and I've walked up your front drive and now I'm a solicitor, and I'm all the way at your door, and I glance and I see the no soliciting sign, the beautiful no soliciting sign that I couldn't read until I got to the door. Am I ringing the doorbell? Sure. And claiming I didn't see it? Yes. And, and I've had a problem as a police officer on occasion when I've gone to somebody's house and they've told me, I've got it posted. And I go to the solicitor, and, and believe me, people don't lie, but they do once in a while. And the solicitor says, well, what's he going to do, right? Come on. You got some 16-year-old young man or 18-year-old young man and I, or woman, and I say to him, didn't you see the sign? No, I didn't see the sign. <laughs> you know, and, and I go over there, and I look, and I stand on the sidewalk, or I'm, I got him across the street, and I look over there, and, I, and they go, what, that thing that... You know, you're, and you're like, yeah, that thing. It's not, it's pretty, but it's not, it's not as one. visible. Here, how do you want to keep a solicitor from coming up your sidewalk and walking to your door? Is if they could see the sign before, like, and, and then the police officer comes, and I come, and he says, I could read that. Now, you know, and to, you know now I can say, really? When I'm standing across the street and I'm looking and I'm pointing at the sign, I go, oh, I can see it from here and my vision's not that good anymore, right? That's better for us. Now, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy neon lights and say no <laughs> soliciting on them. But, it, it, you know, and I'm not saying you have to get something ugly, but, you know, I, that's, why, that's where my suggestion's going to come in. Let's get creative, folks. Okay. All of you, and, and, and I believe a lot of you in this room, 
are the people that when I drive around town, I see very nice, well-kept yards, I see effort, I see people that have, over the years, really uh, taken care of their homes and putting some things together. And you're more organized than, than the younger generations a lot of times. There's probably no big wheels all over the yard and everything else. And uh, my guess is that all of you could come up with a way to really turn, instead of going to the, the hardware store and buying one of those 50 cent uh, big no soliciting, plastic no soliciting signs with the black background and the orange, bright optic orange letters, because none of us would enjoy posting that on, our, on the in front of our house. We work too hard to make it. And who wants to put a farm, a farm, the kind of thing you would nail to a farm post, a fence post, on the front of your home? What would be wrong? How many of you have a little elf in your yard or a little, you know, little, little, no. little, little no. ornament? No. See, I didn't even do it right. No. no. Or, Something like that. I mean, a little sign. Sometimes people put welcome signs out and stuff like that. What would be wrong with something clearly marked like that, but yet it looks nice, maybe even homemade or whatever, but that will hold up? That when I'm walking down the sidewalk and I look up your, your sidewalk and I see right there to the left of your door and your, by your bushes, whatever, a sign or something that says, and it, and it looks so inviting, but what are the words? No soliciting. <laughs> right? I think, I actually, what I thought about was when I dreamed this up last night, and I did dream it up last night, as I thought, because I was thinking how I was going to help you. And I thought, well, I'm going to do this myself now. And then I thought when I was done with it, I thought maybe I don't tell you guys today, and maybe that's an idea I want to market when I retire, you know, someday. <laughs> But, but, but I obviously am not that kind of person. I'm not into that. But I, what I'm trying to say is I think that's a, one of those brilliant ideas that we would see. KTEL, get the KTEL sign, you know, flashing, whatever. But, you know, I, I even thought, wow, wouldn't it be neat if they did decide to start walking out my yard, that the thing just started flashing at me. You know, that's a guy thing. Uh, yes? Let me ask. Uh, I have not found uh, that I uh, have a lot of solicitors coming to my door. Okay, that's good. Now, is, does the village issue only so many soliciting signs per month? Soliciting permits, you mean? Yeah, I mean, we don't, I mean, we're it's, I'm intelligent gonna... enough to know that if a Girl Scout is coming up to sell their right. cookies, we're not going to call the police on her. <laughs> Or the boys out here to sell a Christmas tree. I, mean, I, I just don't have that many solicitors. I have. I called on the Boy Scouts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had to see the look on her face. Honey, that was priceless. That was priceless. You look like you could have, like, uh, you know, I thought I was going to get it. Yeah, no, I, don't no, I would never do that. No, I agree. No, I mean, I don't know how the rest of you feel, how many solicitors you have. Maybe. They your neighborhood more, but how many have a we lot get, of I just bring this up, we get a lot of complaints. We do, and it varies. And But here, have any of you ever, or so am I talking about topics that none of you are interested in? Tell me, because I got more. Does anybody have any problems with solicitors? Let's see a sign of hands here. Who, who, who is soliciting a concern for? Like, they don't like having strangers come up to their door, and they put a sign out, and they still come up and knock on their door. Who has that problem in this room? Yeah, One, two, three, four. Okay, only four people. So, and, then, and if you don't put up a no soliciting sign on your door, chances are you don't have that problem. So that's good. I'm glad to hear. I had one trying to sell my orange. Oh, so you had one trying to sell you. Yeah. It's all, it's, it, it's just, it's out there and we get the complaints from time to And, uh, I just tried to make that clear for you folks, and we should move on because I got more topics to talk about here real quick. Um, I wanted to go on to a topic uh, about, because we just got some, some current information to us about financial exploitation, okay? Because this is also another topic, and when we talk, see, when I talk about soliciting, I talk about, like, somebody just cold calls, 
on the phones and things like that. It's not necessarily a solicitor, but they're trying, they're asking you questions. They might identify themselves as somebody who's got a product to sell you, but you need to be careful. I want, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through this, but I have a, a flyer that I didn't bring copies for, but I'd be happy to give you all. And at the next meeting, I will bring a copy for everybody if you need it after I've gone through it more thoroughly to, to weed out what you don't need and what you don't want. Um, but I, I'm gonna tell you this. The, the, here, I'm gonna go through this real quick. I'm just gonna give you some ideas. These are some of the scams you could see and maybe some of you have. If you've seen them, raise your hand, okay? Utility imposter scams. Have any of you felt like you've had somebody come to your door because everybody trusts the utility company, right? So they actually walk onto our property with a little thing, read our meter or whatever, and we just allow it. They walk to the, the electric company will walk right through our driveway to our backyard, do something on the pole or back there by that, and then leave, right? Okay. Well, there are such things as utility imposter scams. Oh, yeah. And when people come to your door, they could be asking you for information about, I'm with, I'm with uh, Chicago Energy. I just come up with a name. Chicago uh, Unique Energy. And we're a new company. We're providing great energy, uh, an opportunity for you to save on energy costs. And, uh, boy, you're going to really love this. It's going to save you a lot of money. Okay. I start looking around the room and here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the one of you that seems to be the most attentive about it, losing, we're saving a lot of money. The same thing goes when I come to your door. If you don't act interested, I don't want to spend too much time with you because I'm not going to get the information I want. If you're not talkative, I'm not going to get the information I want. And in a minute, I'm going to get, we're going to go into one of my demonstrations and I'm going to show you guys something. I'm going to say, oh, brother, how many of us haven't been caught up into that? Um, driveway ceiling, home repair. Okay, so now you all had that. You know, that's one of the top, when I went to a school many, many, many years ago, driveway ceiling, there they talked about, uh, you know, people from South Carolina that drove up here and, and did the driveway scam where they come to you and they say, we just did our driveway a couple blocks over and we've got some product left. And we can do it for you for a hundred bucks, and you think, well, that's, geez, it's going to take me a lot of energy. A hundred bucks is good. I have somebody else do it, and they put it down. And it looks beautiful. Your driveway is the nicest looking driveway on the block until it rains. Until it rains. Because what they put down was water based and not oil based. Okay, and you know that's a danger. That's a scam. Okay, and you'll never find them. Okay. Uh, again, you know, even if you wrote out a check, it's just going to be a nightmare for you. Okay, because they just took that check into your bank and cashed it, basically. Okay. Um, let's see. Grandchild in distress. That's that's one we don't hear a lot about, but you know, or, or a family where you've had that. You had somebody come to you and say that their grandchild. Or telephone. Call you up and say that they're they need some money bad. And, isn't it kind of strange though that you didn't know them, right? Isn't it kind of strange that we just randomly pick a number and call them and say, my grandchild's in distress, I really need some money? My question would be, unless my phone was listed, uh, how do you even know where I live? How do you even know who you're calling that I'm even around, you know? But um, that's, be careful. Be very careful. Do you have something on that, Chief? Yeah, you, you know how that one works is that you'll get that phone call and it'll be late at night early in the morning, you're half asleep, mm -hmm. and it's real scratchy, like if I were to call you and I start scratching on the phone, mm -hmm. and I go, Grandma, Grandma, and what's the first thing you say? Billy, is that you? What did you just tell the caller? Give them their name. Yeah. You just gave them the name because you woke up, it's a broken call, it's scratchy, I need help, can you wire money someplace, I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. and you'd be amazed. They make 50 of those phone calls, they get four or five of them that wire off a couple thousand dollars yeah. someplace. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, always be real careful with that one. But that's, it, it's, it's a similar thing. And, and, and uh, Sergeant Johnson, I have a, a unique history that I've done some of this crime prevention stuff that you right. do. And we've been to some of the same trainings. But um, we, we get people a lot of times that it's easy to get information out of you. Like someone might go to a, a fortune teller. 
okay? And some people believe in that, I don't, and you'll sit down and you'll walk in, I'm the fortune teller, and say, something's bothering you, isn't it? And you go, how'd you know? <laughs> well, you came in here, okay? And it probably has to do with family or money. How'd you know? Well, because those are the two most popular. Right. If I start guessing the most popular thing, so that's how a lot of these confidence games work, especially the one where you can't tell who it is. Be careful what you say on the phone to these people. The other thing you started to mention about the utilities, I want to be careful because I know the city or the village here just went out for electric aggregation where we're going to get contracts and bids from electrical contractors to save everybody money. And I don't think they're coming door to door. I don't think they are. But, but, if, but if they do, they're going to be have a Villa Park solicitor's license. Yes. Don't have it. It's U.S. But, mail. Yeah, is that yeah, how they do they're that? coming by the mail. But um, the other part is don't ever let somebody in your house. No. Ever, ever, no. ever. No. Yeah, that's, that's the big no. scam is we're here from the electric company. We need to check your circuit in the house. And two guys will come in, and one of them takes you to this electrical panel while the other one's rummaging around yeah. upstairs. So. And can I tell you this, too, folks? How many of you... If that happened to you, and you realized it after they left, would, and, and, and they didn't just rummage through your drawers and throw stuff out, how many of you would know that, and, I, and I'm going to tell you this, because this happens to you. This is an example. There's your wristwatch sitting on that table there, right, on your nightstand, right? You left it there, right? The night before. And now they've been in there, and the one guy goes, wow, Rolex. Puts his pocket, okay? So now they you say goodbye to him at the door, the guy's standing there just like he was when you went to the meter, and he's got your wristwatch, of course, or your grandfather's wristwatch or something like that, and you immediately start getting kind of suspicious to think, oh god, I hope those guys are on the up and up, and you start looking around and you're looking for something and move, touched, whatever. Are you gonna really recognize that your wristwatch is missing? Now you might. Okay, but it just depends. The, the, if we think about everything we've got in our house, and I always try to stress this, this is probably one of the most important points, is it's a whole lot easier to see that I pulled cards out here and there's some disarrayed that, and I took some of the guy's cards, and, the, and you know, it's a whole lot easier than if I take the whole card pack. Now you're not really even sure if that's where you put it. It just, you know, it's, it's just missing, you know. Now, there are things like that that don't work real well, like if they take your Cadillac off the front of your drive. And then you notice that. Yeah, then you notice that. You notice things like that. But, but smaller things and valuables, and personal valuables, are important. That's why you don't let these people in your house. Strangers, okay? Uh, and numbers of strangers is really important, too. Okay. So, um, I'm going to let you take this one, Chief, because I'm going to let you run with this one, because I honestly... Make, make it quick. I'm late for my 12 o'clock meeting, so... It's <laughs> <laughs> lunch, ain't it? I it is lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's right on, too, you know. You see him glance up at that 12 o'clock time and everything. I didn't, need to, I didn't need to look at the clock to know it was lunchtime. My stomach told me. I was just going to say, I have a feeling the restaurant's open past one. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. The pigeon drop. And I have a feeling, do you know? I know the pigeon drop, oh, yeah. yeah. I have a feeling he's going to be able to give a little bit better detail about the pigeon drop. When, when, when we talk about confidence games, and, and I teach this at, at junior college, the key is confidence. If someone gains your trust and confidence, are they more likely to take advantage of you? And the answer is they are. And as always in a confidence game, what's the one thing that a con artist looks for is that little twinkle in your eye where maybe you're just a little greedier than you thought you were or right. didn't think you were. Because in a pigeon drop game, uh, they call it a pigeon drop, it's about switching money, it's about switching packages, it's about convincing you that you have just come into some good fortune that someone found something of value and they want to share it with you, but just in case they got to give it back, do you have money of your own in case we got to give this back? And it preys on seniors, preys on seniors who are alone, um, and, and, and these people are very, very convincing that they're going to convince you that they found something, that they'd like you to share in it because they're right near you, you're sitting on the bench near the park and they found something nearby 
And, you know, in this case we have to give it back, do you have money of your own? Well, you need to prove that you have money of your own. And what we look for in our community is we train our bank tellers. You get a, you get a customer coming in, especially a senior, that coming in taking out a lot of money, with, that doesn't seem real sure about what they're doing, we ask the bank tellers to, to make inquiries. Well, this person told me to and not to tell anyone. Whoa, red flag there. Yeah. Um, was it P.T. Barnum said, there's a, there's a sucker born every minute, and, and he would know he was gypped out of several fortunes himself, but there, there's no such thing as a free lunch. No one's going to give you anything, and why should you have to prove that you have money just to get money? The phone call rings, you've won the Jamaican lottery. You didn't even know you entered the Jamaican lottery. Yeah, I know. But do you have the money to pay the taxes on this big prize? Send it to us and we'll send you the prize. No, 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 no. So um, if ever you're approached by someone looking to get you to prove that you have money, bells and whistles hopefully will go off. Or if you hear friends of yours is happening, bells and whistles should go off that you don't need to prove what you have to anyone. You should never be giving money to get something. That's a scam. The pigeon drop is about, uh, who remembers the movie The Sting? Uh, Robert Redford, I love that movie. The classic con game of switching things, but if, you're, if you think you're gonna get something for nothing, that, that, that's what they're gonna try and do.